Now, we've got a really interesting cross-section here of people from, plat from, sorry, from not platforms actually, from firms and consultants working both in the US and the UK. Um, and it's, we thought it was really important to get people from the US and the UK because in the US, in many respects, the US industry is a lot further down the road in terms of mainstream acceptance of the, of the whole kind of alternative finance space. I bumped into a couple of platform, sorry, funds here today who are deploying hundreds of millions of pounds regularly in the US market. So US is a very developed industry. But equally at the same time, I think, it, and let's, let's debate this, it's not unfair to say that the regulatory requirements, in, sorry, re regulatory environment in the UK is fairly liberal and is actually fairly allowing. So for instance, crowdfunding equity in America is though not illegal, it's not, it's not, you know, there are crowdfunding equity platforms out there. It's nowhere near as big as it is in the UK. Um, there are different forms of crowdfunding equity out there. Obviously, donation based is much bigger. Peer-to-peer -peer loans, much, much bigger in the States. So the UK and the US particularly, and we're, we're probably, we might even touch on the whole European issues because, you know, we are supposed to be part of one single market. Um, whether or not we are actually in financial services is a, a separate question. Okay, so without, without, I'll just open it up for free debate here. So just chip in straight away. Um, is it easier, in your view, to do business in America than it is in the UK and Europe? It are, it is, it is the, are the American requirements particularly onerous and the UK regulators particularly easygoing on the platforms? Shall I kick off? Yes. It's working. Um, I think what you've got in the UK is not necessarily an easier regime, necessarily, yep. but you've got clarity. You've got clarity, um, whether it's equity-based platforms that somebody wants to invest through, and you've got clarity now for peer-to-peer -peer lending as well. And I think that's, that's something that's really helpful. Brand new regime considered for this specific market, um, and I think that clarity is really helpful for the market. The FCA has <laughs> actually um, instituted more regulatory oversight with respect to peer-to-peer -to -peer than its counterpart, the SEC, has in the US. Yeah. And in a way, though, I think is actually beneficial to the industry, to what um, was said earlier with respect to the amount of regulation. There's a certain level of regulation that I think investors want to see in order to get comfortable with investing either in a platform in, uh, equity or buying loans off of a platform, for instance. And I think also there's a level of operational due diligence, for instance, um, funds where the auditors are asking for the, fund, for the investment fund to have policies and procedures for evaluating platforms. Mm. So there's, there's a regulatory component to, from my perspective, there's a level of regulation which helps the industry because it, it legitimizes the industry. I think that's uh, something I would agree with to a greater part, but not in entirety. I think in the UK, we've got a regulatory regime which is probably further ahead than many other jurisdictions in terms of actually recognizing fintech concepts such as crowdfunding, peer-to-peer -peer lending. But what we have is a framework which is not designed to facilitate business, but that's not unusual because the way regulation comes into being is that you see a problem regulators, parliament, introduce new rules to deal with that problem. Whereas what we have at the moment are businesses trying to wrestle their way through an existing regulatory framework to make it work for something it was not originally designed for. Because I think a lot of fintech businesses, both in terms of protecting our customers, but also VCs and investors, they wouldn't actually disagree if you say, we need strong regulation in the sense yeah, of, well, do absolutely. we want no, our no, businesses to have you. integrity? I agree with you. Yeah. Do we want to do the right things? All of the things that we see in regulation are good. It's making it work in the right way. There's the correct level of regulation. Strong regulation, I completely agree with you. I think the UK is further ahead than the US. Uh, in, in regulation. I think the U.S. suffers from fragmented regulators. You have yes. uh, the Federal Reserve that regulates banking on the yeah. front end. You have the SEC uh, and FINRA, which regulate the investor side. And you've got state legislation. You, you have 52 state regulators, including D.C. and Puerto Rico. Uh, so, and, and the mindset among platforms in the U.S. is, I don't want to be regulated as, any more than I absolutely need to. So even larger platforms like Lending Club and Prosper have uh, threaded the needle through five different patchworks of regulations that normally would apply to businesses like that. So, you know, we have a little bit still of a run and hide approach uh, 
or a, you know, this is the reason why I don't have to be a broker dealer, this is the reason why I don't have to be an investment advisor, this is the reason why I'm not an investment company, and everyone looks at that and says, well, yeah, but you're really lending, you're really borrowing, you're really putting money to work. Here, um, it's more transparent. It's a legitimate alternative lending sector. Uh, the government actually supports it and is out in front of the, of the issue and subsidizes the industry. Yeah. And, and you, you don't have that yet in the U.S. Um, it's, it's a huge market, obviously, which is why you see scale. There's 350, people, 350 million people. Um, but at the same time, it's still very young. Many people haven't heard of peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, there's a lot of legal uh, uncertainty with respect to the SEC and crowdfunding also. You mentioned uh, rewards crowdfunding, which is not regulated generally. Um, and then on the equity side and the debt side, you're allowed to do uh, all, uh, accredited investor crowdfunding, but not to the public yet. Uh, I, I suppose what this, one of the issues that we touched on a little bit earlier, which is when we talked about tax wrappers, is there is this uncertainty, which is the regulators tend to approach, certainly in the UK, they tend to, there's securities here, Okay, and that's straightforward. They've got a whole body of legislation and compliance around securities. And there's funds over there. So they know how to deal with funds, yeah? And then there's alternative finance that's somewhere in the middle, yeah? Because there are funds, yeah? And then there are people issuing securities, yeah? And, but a lot of the industry is in the middle. It's direct loans. And, I mean, th that I know has caused a problem in the UK because actually, how do you figure your way through things like ICE as tax wrappers? Because actually tax wrappers are usually based upon a fund structure or a security structure. You know who to go after for securities, you go after the, you know, the, 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 all the fiduciary responsibilities to go with securities. It's, uh, same in America. But is, there, is that a real problem? Because I know that's a real problem in the UK for some of the end users, like financial advisors, because they actually find it very difficult to deal with. We heard it earlier, actually, which is they, they run them from because actually it's not funds, what they're used to, and they, they don't really like securities, actually, but they could deal with securities. I mean, is that, is that a real issue for the industry, both in the US and the UK? I I'm not a nodding, so I'm yeah, guessing I, yes. I, I think that it is, and I think one of the things that you see, and I think the word alternative can be yes. a little bit scary to the regulator, yeah. in the sense that many of these activities, if we were talking 15, 20 years ago, we would just talk about them in terms of corporate finance. Absolutely. And so the regulator would be saying, that's fine, that's all the big boys, they're sophisticated players. But actually, the modern changes have meant that actually new retail investors are able to access things previously they were kept out at. But that in itself introduces new risks. What degree of investment should somebody be putting through their ISA? Uh, if they're, a, a, let's take an extreme example, a 90-year-old grandmother with her ISA savings. The, the, legendary, the legendary Mrs. Miggins of 36 Acacia Avenue, Tunbridge Wells. Exactly. Maybe <laughs> a very small percentage to get a larger return would be suitable, but 100% of investments? Clearly not. And it's those kinds of issues that I think the regulator hasn't really had to work through. So he hasn't got a clear strategy, and that is seen throughout regulatory uh, all aspects of regulation. I think that's what's got to be wrestled with. Uh, and that's when you sometimes see in practice slightly, I'll call it, uh, split personality from the regulator in that they've got this duty to protect individuals, whilst at the moment, which I think is unusual for a regulator, a duty to promote competition and their intention. Yeah. Um, I totally agree with what you're saying in terms of the split personality there. I think nowhere was it more evident than when they actually decided what the two regimes were going to be because they've um, structured it to have investment-based platforms, a mixture of yep. securities, even if they're debt securities, yep. and then um, loans-based platforms. And so the debt-based security platforms are subject to this, all the same rules as equity, despite perhaps having a more similar risk profile yes. to the loans-based platforms. I think that where you have... <laughs> sorry. No, no, go for it. The, the problem in the U.S., at least, is that the traditional gatekeepers of suitability, which is what we're really talking yes, about, exactly. is uh, the function of a broker. And Lending Club and Prosper and any of the other platforms that are operating today are not brokers. And so you don't have that gatekeeper function. There's nothing to stop a 90-year-old grandmother from going on and putting her whole life savings into fixed income um, or anything else. I mean, obviously, you mentioned lottery and, and horse racing and... and <laughs> everything else. So the, that, that's part of the problem is that the traditional gatekeeping functions are in traditional mechanics and a lot of these platforms can operate in a world that's aside from that. Yep. The other issue is that more and more of the platforms are in whole loan sales which generally are not considered by the SEC to be securities and therefore 
Uh, you're seeing the, the mainstream channel going to institutions uh, and then being sold out in securitizations in, in a transaction that really never touches the SEC. You're, you're not seeing the same level of um, interest or concern, at least not at the federal level in the U.S., mm. with respect to investors' ability to be able to invest, to, to um, go onto a website and invest in uh, consumer loans, for instance. Um, you are seeing um, a, an interest on the part of the regulators um, for those businesses that operate as investment advisors um, or who um, cross into broker-dealer issues um, to make sure that those are those institutions are regulated just as any other advisor or broker-dealer will be regulated. So effectively, the, if we could typify an American approach, which is, um, as is the way with America, many of these things, lots of different jurisdictions, lots of different regulators, trying to make the sense of things, but they're actually looking at for the organizational structure the intermediary that they're working through, so the broker-dealers, and they're trying to regulate that activity. Correct. Whereas in the UK and Europe, it's a slightly different thing, isn't it? They're trying to look at the suitability of the investment, of the yeah. investor. Now, call me a cynic, and I have been called a cynic many times, um, and, um, and call me a cynic, but here in the UK, I, I can't help, I've written about investment for donkey's years, 20 years, yeah? And every time, in fact, I think I can't remember if you said it, every time the word alternative comes out, I start writing about it, yeah, um, and I get some amazing new alternative investment class. I write about an EFT, and I now write about an old fine and all that kind of stuff. And with about five or six years, it blows up, yeah. Um, something goes horribly wrong, yeah. Somebody loses a load of money, the Mrs. Miggins. And then the regulators swoop down, and I'm, I'm, I apologize, I'm being very unfair to regulators in terms of char characterizing them as kind of, you know, um, ancient dinosaurs running around trying to, to attack interesting new companies. They swoop down and they shut it down, basically. They don't like it because they just think, in the UK, it's unsuitable. People can't take these risks. It's just not right. They don't quite say that, but well, you I can see them saying it. <laughs> Absolutely. I think you're right, absolutely. Consumer protection is the core of the entire regime. And even though there are rules written for both types of platforms, and loans-based or investment-based, what I'm seeing when firms are going through the authorization process and you're sitting down in front of the FCA, you are having to show the user journey of the platform yeah, yeah, in okay. to the nth degree. Yeah. Um, and also kind of generally talking about kind of the culture of the firm, you know, are the customers at the heart of it, et cetera. And I think that really, hopefully, is a preemptive strike. So that they might not mm. do what I describe. They might not. They're certainly <laughs> trying to avoid it, I would say, by getting in there early. Uh, even going beyond perhaps the rules that are actually set so down. Being a bit, so actually being proactive, proactive. Going as opposed to reactive. Rules, Gosh, absolutely. that would be a change. But um, we, ha you know, we need to think about Europe as well. That's yes, I will come, I'll literally come back to that. Second. There's two reasons why this might be different than the past trends that have all fallen on their face. Number one is that the platforms and the regulators actually have an open dialogue. So if you go right, and yes, talk to the, to the heads of these uh, platforms, um, and, and the first question a lot of investors will ask them is, well, what does the Fed think of this? What does the FCA think? Uh, they say, well, we, we just met with them. We talked to them. We talked to the New York Fed. We adjust our underwriting criteria based on uh, macroeconomic factors, and we're all in consultation together. So that's one big issue that you didn't see in the past where you had these investor structures blow up and, and people came and looked to see what was going on. Um, the regulators will deny all of that when it does blow up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, the other issue is that if you go back, and I, I was at Barclays during the uh, uh, crisis, and so w what you see here that's different from any other crisis is, at least for the time being, you have the absence of anyone complaining. And what spurs on regulatory yeah. investigations, both in, in, in the UK and in the US, are people who are complaining. You have uh, willing borrowers bar borrowing at rates as advertised, you have investors more or less getting the rates as disclosed. Um, as long as disclosure is more or less uh, uh, current and, and robust, and, and we have service providers who provide that, um, you're not going to see a whole lot of complaints. There's a whole other targeted group that's sort of taking the heat but off right now. Can I just ask a very quick question, because we're, uh, we're running on a tight time. But when those first big complaints come in, and, and the Mrs. Miggins of the world, I don't know why it's always Mrs. Miggins, it could be Mr. Miggins. Um, while the Mr. and Mrs. Miggins of the world lose their money, how long would it take? One year, two year, three months? I think that's an interesting question, and I think there's a difference between the US and the yeah. UK. I think in the US, actually, 
their approach to regulation is much more enforcement-led. The yes, SEC absolutely, is more absolutely. active. Yeah. Uh, whereas in the UK, one of the things which I think is beneficial is there is more of a supervisory dialogue. And yeah. I think my gut instinct, whenever I am asked this question, I say when the sort of complaints start to come through, actually that normally filters through a supervisory process. And what you see with the FCA is that there'll normally be some kind of consultation paper, a thematic review. It isn't a case where people are just pounced upon. Very often they're given some subtle messages from yes, the regulator. Yes. You need to yep. change. And it's the ones who don't change who get into different. So you should watch no, out for subtle messages. We've already had, I think we have already had quite a few nudges. Yes. Quite a few letters went out last year. We've had a review. I do wonder if some platforms platforms continue and kind of don't pay attention to those messages that have been coming out, whether we'll see a little bit of enforcement action. I, I don't think that the outcome of enforcement is going to be that your you platform have to go out of business, because if you think about how people lose money, it's not because yeah. the platform has failed, it's because they aren't properly diversified, and the one or two loans they're bought, they bought defaulted. So n now you're going to see the next level of regulation in a few years, which is you can't invest X dollars unless you're uh, spread across X number of loans or through X asset classes or loan classes. And so you're going to see that kind of more sophisticated overlay, I think. Um, again, low millions, so much to talk a bit about, but um, we're going to pick up this conversation in the breakout room. Um, and I'm pretty sure my colleague Ryan is going to ask you a bit about what happens when those kind of conversations happen. And as, as you've already mentioned, what those kind of conversations are going to be. What, what should you watch out for? What are the hints? But in the meantime, put your hands together. Go and watch them in the breakout room. Thank you very much for coming along.